Book Two, Quarantine. Chapter Five. The three moon-suited CDC specialists corralled them in the bio lab. Before walking them inside the enclosed room, Kate and Jay placed their removed hoods in a large yellow bag marked with a biohazard symbol. Anything that had been inside either lab was considered to be contaminated and would be destroyed. You mean studied? Was what Kate thought. No way they were simply going to burn that up, not without a chance of figuring out what infected Marie. At this point, she didn't much care either. She wanted food. She wanted to pee. And she wanted to get the hell out of Hal with her daughter. And what did the CDC want? For none of them to leave. Those feds hadn't seen the thing in the lab, hadn't watched it move and devour. All they'd seen was four terrified scientists in the midst of a complete freakout. And instead of getting the hell out of the building, they were quarantined in the goddamn lab. Still in her chem suit, sans hood, she sat in one of the rolling chairs near the commuter station. Jay was slumped against the wall. He looked as though he was going to nod off at any moment, but she knew better. He might be exhausted, but after what they'd seen, she wasn't sure either of them would ever sleep again. The leader of the CDC crew, Dr. Melanie Hoyt, had a tablet in her gloved hands. She tapped the screen as she spoke. So what was the extent of your exposure? Jay and Kate looked at one another. Kate shrugged and stared at the woman in the moon suit. A single lock of Dr. Hoyt's hair had come loose and dangled inside her mask. Her voice was muffled, but perfectly understandable. Well, neither Jay nor I had direct contact with the M2, Kate said. Dr. Hoyt raised an eyebrow. M2? Jay cleared his throat. It's what we call the oil. It's from a trench called M2. It's located near Papua New Guinea. The doctor nodded. Where PPE drilled. Right, Kate said. The sample arrived yesterday afternoon in a typical oil barrel. Marie, Ms. Krieger? Yes, Dr. Hoyt. Kate felt like slapping the woman's hands every time she looked back down at her tablet. Marie hooked up the barrel to our vacuum pump system. She cut herself on the barrel's lid when she perforated it. Dr. Hoyt frowned. Her green eyes bored into Kate's. And what's the procedure when that occurs? Excuse me? Jay asked. You implying something? No, Dr. Hoyt said, clearly implying something. Just wanted to know what the procedure is when you are contaminated by the oil. Oil is not contamination, Jay said. If it was, you wouldn't be putting the shit in your fucking car, lady. No need to be defensive, Dr. Hoyt said. Look, Doc, Jay said, his finger pointing at the other lab. You didn't see what just happened. You weren't in there with that thing. It's loose in the goddamned building, and you want to give us the third degree about procedure? The moon-suited doctor dropped her hands, the tablet tapping against one knee. She glared at Jay. We're getting to that, Mr. Hollingsworth. Doctor, he corrected her. Excuse me, Hoyt said. Dr. Hollingsworth. A young woman is dying at Ben Tob, and we need to know why. She tapped her foot. And I don't understand why you're making up some story about a monster. Jay opened his mouth, but no words came out. Kate knew exactly how he felt. Look, I don't expect you to believe us, but if we just sit here, that thing is going to come back here and kill us, and we need to get everyone the hell out of the building. Dr. Hoyt's foot stopped tapping. She turned to the other CDC personnel. I'm sure these fine scientists will stay here with me. Go cordon off the area, do a search and sweep and find any other people. We need them quarantined as well. I need to get my daughter. Kate said. Now, please let me go. No one leaves unless they're in a suit, Dr. Hoyt growled, and not contaminated. We're not contaminated, Kate yelled. We never touched it. It could be airborne, one of the CDC drones said. Kate stood from the chair and walked up to Dr. Hoyt. If it's airborne, she said, we're already screwed because this will have broken out on Leaguer. And if it's airborne, the chopper pilots who took it off the rig infected more people, and so on. Kate swallowed. You'd already have thousands of dead bodies. It's not airborne. Hoyt flexed her fingers. Kate didn't drop the stare, but she saw them in her peripheral vision. Okay, Hoyt said. 
but we can't prove that right now. We have to treat this like it's airborne until we're sure. Kate's lip quivered with anger. Fine, then do your job and get our people safe. Hoyt said nothing, but her eyes hardened. Now, Kate hissed. Dr. Cheevers, where should we look for the others? Hoyt asked. Second and third floors, Kate pointed at the phone. We can call Mike and get him to tell everyone in the two buildings to meet at a common place. Dr. Hoyt blinked. Adjoining buildings? Yeah, Jay said, connected with a sky bridge. It's supposed to be ready for us in a couple of months. Mike is in this building. There's at least one more employee as well, Bill said, and a security guard. The doctor's moon suit crinkled as she turned to her team. That big foyer at the main entrance. That's where I want all the employees. She glanced at Kate. All the non-contaminated personnel. Glaze? Duggar? Retrieve Dr. Cheevers' daughter and bring her here. Then sweep the building and stay in contact. We'll call Mr. Beaudry and get the message to everyone else. Okay, Mel. A short, heavy beard graced the CDC man's chin and his voice dripped with a Texan accent. Come on, Glaze. Let's do this. The two CDC men walked to the door and headed out into the hallway. Hoyt turned back to the scientists. They'll get your daughter and then they'll do their jobs. Can you call Mr. Beaudry for me? Kate nodded. I'll do it. But you need to do more. She took a deep breath. That thing dissolves anything that isn't metal or glass. And that's not all. It started out as just a few liters. Now it's huge. The CDC doctor's lips twitched. Oh. You still don't believe us? No, Hoyt said. I don't. Kate's face flushed. She was so angry, her body sizzled. I'm calling Mike. Then you're going into the chem lab, and maybe you could tell us what happened. In the meantime, Neil, show our CDC friend the SEM image. Dr. Hoyt raised an eyebrow. You scanned it? Yeah, we scanned it, Neil grinned. Want to see something you've never seen before? Duggar waited until they'd left the quarantined hallway before snickering. He looked at his partner. Glaze's face was locked in a grimace. Duggar pointed at him. You believe that crap? Glaze shook his head. I don't know, man. I mean, they sound insane. Yes, they do, Duggar said. Houston CDC might not be Atlanta, but as the fourth largest city in the USA and one of the busiest ports in the world, the federal government had made sure the presence was adequate. After 9-11, the worry had been anthrax or weaponized smallpox. After Liberia, it had been Ebola. And after Florida, dengue fever. The possible diseases entering the country were skyrocketing. Hell, if people didn't start vaccinating their kids again, something like polio might kill an entire generation. Duggar hoped he'd be dead long before something like that happened. How do you want to do this? Glaze asked. What do you mean? They walked toward the foyer where Dr. Hoyt wanted them to set up triage. Get the other team in here. Get them to set things up and meet me upstairs, easy peasy. Glaze grunted. Easy? What does that even mean? Something redneck related? Typical, just what he expected from a damned Midwesterner. The man didn't understand that swamps and mosquitoes and ridiculously uncomfortable heat were all part of the Houston experience. He whined during the summer froze during the winter, and was a general pain in the ass. Maybe Glaze would head back to Chicago soon. Duggar certainly hoped so. The guy was talented, but Christ, you could only put up with so much bitching. Look, partner, Duggar drawled. It means no problem. Comprende? Whatever, man, Glaze rubbed at his arm. We might need beds in here. Beds, Duggar said. Enough of this shit. He wanted to find Dr. Cheevers' kid and wait for the rest of the HAL personnel to get their asses down here. Sooner they had the place contained, the sooner everybody could go home. Ain't gonna need beds, Glaze. He turned and walked toward the elevator bank. Wait, Glaze said. Where are you going? Duggar twisted his hand into the shape of a gun, index finger pointing toward the ceiling. Up. Isn't that where the kid is? Yeah, Glaze said. But we shouldn't use the elevator. Duggar sighed. We don't have security keys to get through the fire stairs. The other CDC man shook his head. Bullshit, we can get one from the security guard. Yeah, 
Duggar said and stabbed the up button. But I ain't walking up the stairs in this get up unless forced. Lazy bastard, Glaze said. Duggar grinned. That's fat lazy bastard to you. Now get those guys in here and meet me on the second floor. I want to sweep this place before the sun comes up. Right, Glaze said. Because you have plans. Eh, hey, now, Duggar said. I always plan a little pickle tickle for the wife in the morning. Pickle tickle, Glaze echoed. See you upstairs. The elevator dinged. That you will, Duggar said. When the doors opened, he walked inside and pressed the button marked two. He waved at Glaze as the doors closed. The radio in his helmet belched a stream of static. He winced. Hoyt was probably trying to get a status report. Duggar grinned. The status was they were going to get the kid, get the rest of the folks out of here, and then he could go back to sleep. The elevator dinged. Duggar watched the door slide open. His grin faded. What the? A smell. Her nose wrinkled and she snorted herself awake. Maeve opened her eyes and regarded the dark office. The hallway lights were off. With the office blinds closed, there was no ambient light filtering in from outside. The game console's single green power light glowed like a cat's eye in the darkness. Rain touched the windows. Gusts of wind rattled them. She blinked a few times and then sat up. The smell. It was a combination of cooking meat and something rotten that had been in the sun too long. With a yawn, she reached behind her and clicked on the light. The strong halogen lamp exploded with brightness. She shut her eyes against the glare and then slowly opened them. The table was still clogged with drink cans, an empty coffee mug, and the wrappers from candy bars. She had to clean that up before her mom showed up. And where was she anyway? And what the hell was that smell? She yawned and gathered up the cans and wrappers. She glanced at the coffee mug, decided it was too much to hold, and left it on the table. If mom was still in the lab, she couldn't call, but she could text. Maeve hit the power button on her phone. The display was blank sans the weather alert and the notifications. Oh well, she'd see mom soon enough. Maeve walked to the office threshold and stopped. The smell was stronger, and there was a sound, something she barely made out against the central air's hum. Darkness. She hated it. She always had. Despite the wan rectangle of light that streamed into the hallway from the office, it was too damned dark. She took a deep breath and walked into the hallway. An overhead fluorescent immediately came on. Well, she thought, at least the motion sensors still worked. The smell. Jesus, did something go bad in the break room? Was there a power outage? She hadn't been asleep long enough for that to happen. With her hands full of wrappers and cans, each step was a trick in holding on to it all. With every few steps, another set of lights streamed on. Before she rounded the corner, the lights came on in the adjoining hallway. A shadow appeared on the wall. Maeve's brows furrowed. Hello? Her voice echoed in the empty hall. The shadow disappeared, but the lights remained. Heart thumping in her chest, the back of her neck crawling with goose flesh, she walked to the corner and peered around. An empty hallway stared back at her, but the stench was much more palpable. Her gorge rose in the back of her throat. She let out an acidic burp and turned the corner. The hall was still empty, but something was wrong. The smell was stronger as she approached the break room. It was definitely coming from there. Hello? She called again. No answer. Maeve reached the break room and looked in. The lights came on in the room. The tile floor shined as though it was freshly mopped. In fact, it was impossibly clean. Even the stains were gone. She dropped the aluminum cans in the recycle bin and threw away the wrappers and that's when her sleep-hazed mind made sense of the table and chairs. The plastic was stripped off. The seat backs, once vinyl, had disappeared. The table was bare metal, shining and spotless. Something sizzled. Maeve scanned the room. The counters were clean, but not sparkling clean. Darren had done a good job cleaning up after dinner, but he sure as hell didn't mop the goddamned floor. And the table? The chairs? Who would do that? The bacon sizzle was louder. 
the smell stronger. She ranched but didn't toss dinner. Something was burning, and it wasn't just meat. Plastic. Vinyl. Rubber. And it was behind her. Maeve slowly turned. The sheetrock in the walls was dissolving. Her eyes slowly rose upward. Wisps of smoke escaped through the gaps in the metal supports. She stepped backward. One of the ceiling tiles was gone. Just gone. A thin black stalk slowly descended through the hole. A serpent's black eye popped forth from its end. It blinked at her. Maeve screamed and ran through the other side of the break room. Behind her, she heard the smash and crash of something large falling to the tile floor. She turned the corner and pelted down the hallway. With every hurried step, another fluorescent light popped on. The sizzling sound rose in volume, and something's heavy steps pounded into the floor. Maeve reached the next corner and turned left. Something crashed into the wall. Maeve spun around, panting from the run. A squat black creature with five legs and three arms twirled away from the burned wood and sheetrock. It made no sound other than the sizzling of its feet dissolving the carpet. The thing's eye stalks pointed at her, and a large maw appeared in the center of its body. A hooked tentacle shot out in her direction. Maeve screamed and ran. Heart thumping in her ears, she barely heard the sound of sheetrock cracking and burning as the thing chased her its tentacles smashing into the walls. The elevator bank dinged, but she didn't even hear it. She nearly lost her balance when the carpet switched to tile in front of the elevator. Her left sneaker's toe hit the transition lip. Maeve stumbled, but managed to keep her feet. Within a second, she was past the bank when one of the doors opened. What the? A muffled voice yelled. Maeve turned around. A moon-suited figure had walked halfway out the door when it saw the monstrosity. The thing didn't turn. Instead, its tentacled arms seemed to skate across its surface. The mouth, too. The hooked appendages shot forward and ripped through the fabric. A new smell, cooking flesh, added to the olfactory assault. The man screamed. A mixture of smoke and steam erupted from the torn suit. The man's heavily gloved hands clutched at his ruined chest. One of the thing's appendages rose to the man's shoulder. It hesitated in the air and then whistled as it ripped sideways. The hook smashed into the man's head just behind the temple. A rotten melon squelch echoed in the hallway. The top half of the man's head flew to the ground. Blood, brains, and bone scattered across the tile floor. The figure sagged and then fell forward. Two tentacles reached behind and dragged him into the creature's massive maw. The sizzling of frying meat stung her ears. Smoke billowed from the thing's mouth as the figure slowly disappeared inside. Maeve, mouth open, eyes wide, turned and ran. She made it to the other hallway, swiveled her head, and saw the bright crimson glow of the exit sign. Barely keeping her balance, she bounced off the opposite wall and sprinted toward the fire door. A ripping sound followed her, but she didn't turn around. She hit the fire door's push bar. The heavy steel and glass fire door resisted her at first, but then slowly swung open. The ripping sound increased in volume. Whatever it was, it was closer. Maeve screamed and forced the door wide enough to slink through. She turned and shut it behind her. Something crashed into the door. The stairwell echoed with the sound. Maeve pressed her hands against the steel, hoping against hope the creature couldn't open it. Panting, her eyes filled with starlight. She looked through the glass. There was nothing but impenetrable darkness on the other side of the door. But there was nothing dead about it. It rippled against the glass. Something knocked against the door's bottom half. The door shuddered, but didn't budge. The darkness retreated. When the thing was a few meters away from the door, Maeve froze. Her heart seemed to stop in her chest. It was larger. It barely fit in the hallway. Extra legs jutted out from its base. Two eye stalks waved in the air. Two more stared directly at her. 
its hook-ended appendages dragged across the sheetrock walls. She knew the hallway was filled with that sizzling sound. Miss? She jumped and whirled. Another man in a moon suit stood a few steps down from the landing. His heavy hands clutched at the banister. Are you okay? He said in a muffled voice. Maeve nearly knocked him over when she grabbed him around the waist and started to cry. In the past several hours, he'd been called by the CDC, discovered Marie was most likely going to die, and PPE was up shit creek without a paddle. Their oil wasn't going to get analyzed, and their rig, for all he knew, was now filled with infected people. Because Simpson, PPE vice president, was a good friend of his, Mike had called him shortly after he told Kate and Neil to cease work and prepare for quarantine. Simpson hadn't exactly been thrilled. The fuck you mean you've been quarantined? Mike had a sigh. Uh, Dr. Hutchins from the CDC called me. Told me one of my employees was on death's door and they were worried that whatever she caught, she caught from here. Also, your oil from Leaguer is under suspicion, or at least the barrel is. How is that possible? Simpson's voice bellowed into the phone. This has to be some trick. The Saudis are trying to sabotage him too. They must have. Simpson, calm down. Mike took a deep breath. I didn't believe it either. I called the CDC in Atlanta. They verified his identity and put me right through to him. It's for real. Simpson snorted. God damn it. Look, if that was the case, wouldn't Leaguer be infected? I mean, there's no way they'd have been able to keep themselves away from it. Shit, cleaning out the damned mud traps could expose them, let alone the drilling and filling the barrel. And the engineering team? Calhoun's team were the ones running the damn tests. Mike tried not to sigh. He failed. I don't know how, Simpson. I only know what they told me. God damn it. You know how far behind this puts us? The relative numbness he'd felt suddenly departed. The idea Marie might not ever work again at Hal bounced around in his head. A wave of anger replaced the vacuous feeling of incredulity. I don't give a fuck about your oil, Mike growled into the phone. In case you forgot, one of my employees might be dead even as we speak. There was a long pause after Simpson's deep intake of breath. When he finally spoke, his voice was calm and apologetic. Right, sorry. I should tell my people to stop drilling until we figure this out. Mike nodded to himself. Yes, you should. If you don't, the feds might. God damn it, Simpson said. Okay, Mike, keep me updated. And I'm sorry this happened. If we track it back to the shipping company, I'll have someone's ass. As will I, Mike had replied. Their goodbyes had been cordial, but strained. The exhaustion of the night had finally hit him. The sun was just a few hours away from gracing the horizon. Not like they'd be able to tell with all the cloud cover and the storm pounding the building. Mike had dozed off when the phone rang again. He opened his eyes and stared at the caller ID strip. Biolab, it said. Instantly awake, he reached out and took the receiver. Beaudry. What's up, Neil? It's Kate. Sorry, Kate. Mike chuckled. I, wait, what are you doing in the bio lab? CDC told you guys to stay in your lab. She sighed. That's what I wanted to tell you. We have, um, a little issue. Actually, fuck that. We have a serious problem, Mike. We need everyone in the two buildings to meet in the foyer of building one. Mike stared at the receiver in his hands and then put it back to his ear. What? Don't ask why, just do it. The CDC is here and they want everyone in the foyer. Okay, Mike said. I'm pretty sure Chuckles is the only one in the new building, unless one of the security folks is strolling around. Round them up and get them down here. Oh, do you have a halogen flashlight? Mike opened his mouth and then closed it. What? Do you have a halogen flashlight? Um, I don't know. I might. Kate's voice turned cold. Listen to me very carefully, Mike. You're not going to believe me, and I don't care. But something got out of Chem Lab, and... Something? Yes, shut up and listen. It doesn't like natural light, or anything close to it. He frowned. Are you high? I'm not fucking kidding, 
she screamed into the phone. Just, just find a halogen light if you can. Maybe Chuckles has one or knows where some are. Check with him. Keep them handy. And if you hear a sizzling sound, run from it. Okay? Um, okay. Kate, what the hell is going on? Just do what I told you, okay? We'll see you down in the foyer as soon as you get here. Okay. Be safe, Mike. You too, Kate. He hung up the phone and stared at it. Something escaped from Chem Lab? This had to be a joke. No, she wouldn't do that. Jay? Hell yes. Bill? Absolutely. But Kate? No. The office lamp was a halogen. The amount of heat and light the thing produced was why it was in the far corner of the room. He grinned. If, well, if whatever it was she was afraid of came in here, it was in for a shock. But it wasn't like he could carry the damned lamp around with him. The server room had strong lighting. It might be a good place to hole up if... This is stupid, he said to the empty room. Mike rose from his chair, stretched, and walked toward the door. He stopped. Chuckles. He picked up the phone and dialed the knock. The phone rang and rang. Mike frowned and then sighed. Chuckles must be out of knock one and traipsing around the new knock. He hung up the phone. He'd at least have to check and see if the surly tech was in the new server room. That meant going to the second floor. Oh, well, he was heading there anyway. Rounding up all the staff was easy. Darren was at the hospital. Marie was at the hospital, and all that remained were Chuckles, Jacob the security guard, and himself. Mike stood from his desk and looked at the heavy wooden door leading to the reception area. Normally, Darren would be out there. He wished Darren was there now. Mike might be the CEO, but without Darren, he was barely functional. Besides, Darren would know where the goddamn flashlights were. He reached into his office drawer and pulled out a Glock. The forty caliber would stop whatever the hell had escaped the lab. He checked the magazine, racked the slide to put one in the throat, and jammed it into his waistband. Okay, he said as he opened the door. Let's do this. By the time he got to the elevator, he was too far away to hear the phone ringing.